Many people labor under the notion that the American Revolution was won by a group of sturdy backwoodsmen armed with the Kentucky rifle. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Though backwoodsmen armed with Kentucky rifles did fight and win one battle, King's Mountain, the vast majority of the combat in the American Revolution was linear warfare on the European model. The American Revolution was won by the Continental Line, using the smoothbore musket and the bayonet. I would like to cover this point from the technical end only. To put it simply, the rifle was not technically ready for general combat use. It was, of course, far more accurate than the smoothbore musket, and this accuracy translated into an increase in combat range. But the price paid for this increase was a drastic decrease in volume of fire plus one or two other disadvantages. A smooth bore is exactly what the name implies. The bore is smooth, much like the interior of an ordinary pipe. But in a rifle, spiral grooves are cut in the bore. It looks something like this. What appears as high spots in the barrel are lands. And the distance from the land on one side to the land on the other side is called the bore diameter. The low areas are the grooves, and the distance from the bottom of the groove on one side to the bottom of the groove on the other side is called groove diameter. The rifle gains its accuracy because the projectile spins in flight. In order to gain this spin, the bullet has to be groove diameter so that the lands can engrave corresponding notches on the side of the bullet and thereby induce this spin as the bullet travels down the barrel. But if you have a muzzle loader, how do you load the bullet from muzzle down to breech? In the Kentucky rifle, the problem was solved by taking a ball very near to bore diameter and wrapping it in a lubricated cloth patch. Because the cloth patch was relatively easy to cut, this patch had the notches engraved on it at the muzzle when it was loaded, and this patch then acted as a sabo when the weapon was fired. These weapons were made on the frontier by individual rifle makers. The ramrods were of wood, partly due to ease of manufacture and partly to avoid wearing away the rifling and the soft barrel steels in use at the time. The wooden ramrod Though it has great compressive strength, cannot take much bending or shear force. Care had to be taken in loading so as not to break the ramrod. In order to reduce the resistance to loading to the lowest level possible, the patches were normally very heavily lubricated with tallow or grease or some other similar substance. This lubrication, which might contaminate the powder if left in contact for a long time, plus other obvious problems with the patch, made the paper cartridge of the musket impractical. Therefore, the shooter normally had to carry patches, ball, and powder as separate components and load them individually into the muzzle of the weapon. In order to load, the shooter poured powder from his powder horn into a measuring cup. He then poured this powder down the barrel, centered a patch on the muzzle, centered a ball on the patch, started it in the muzzle with his thumb, and then used a starter ramrod. The use of this starter ramrod is essential, for the resistance to cutting those notches is far greater than the strength of man's grip on this ramrod. So the starter ramrod to start the ball and then get it farther down the barrel so as to act as a guide for the wooden ramrod. Now pull out the wooden ramrod and with short strokes so as not to twist the ramrod, seat it down on the powder and then return the ramrod underneath the barrel. Some shooters did use a loading block. This loading block was nothing more than a piece of wood with holes drilled in it and patch ball combinations seated into those holes. This did speed up the loading a little bit, 
Not that it helped you get it down the muzzle, but it helped the shooter keep all of the various components together. You should remember that all of these things needed to load the Kentucky rifle were either carried on thongs around the shooter's neck or had to be carried in pouches slung across his shoulder. Once the ball was seated on the powder, the shooter could now prime the weapon. Because the bore of the Kentucky rifle was normally very small, the touch hole, pan, frizzle, and hammer were also correspondingly small. So small, in fact, that the large granulations of powder for the main propellant charge were too large to be used in the pan. Therefore, the shooter had to carry a second powder horn with a fine granulation of powder for priming the pan. After closing the frizzen, the shooter was now ready to fire. We will show you this reproduction Kentucky rifle in action against a flintlock smoothbore. For ease of viewing, all of these loading components for the Kentucky rifle will be on a stand right beside the shooter. The musket firer would have only one large pouch with a number of paper cartridges in this pouch, and the pouch would be rigidly held to his body, normally in front with the flap tucked back underneath his waist belt. In fact, a musket shooter could find his cartridges in that pouch just as easily as our demonstration shooter will find them on the stand beside him. The brown Bess's target will be 50 yards downrange, but will not be shown. The accuracy of the Kentucky rifle is quite obvious, but all is still not bliss. Adjustable sights had not then been invented. Therefore, at the longer ranges, the shooter had to compensate by aiming off the target, the so-called Kentucky windage. In the scene you just watched, I basically aimed dead between the breast pockets of my targets at 80 yards. But at 185 yards, I was aiming level with the top of the head of the target 
and slightly to the left and still hit just a bit low right. The ball ricocheted off the ground into the torso and knocked the target down. This would correspond to striking a standing infantryman somewhere in his left thigh. However, Kentucky windage is a relatively nebulous thing and varies greatly from rifle to rifle. The only way it can be learned is through constant firing at a variety of targets. It is something that von Steubon, for example, could not necessarily teach through repetitive drill. If the sights had been adjustable, there would still be no real advance. Most Kentucky rifles varied from 40 to 50 caliber. In the case of this reproduction, I was firing a 445 diameter ball. It weighs 129 grains and exits the muzzle at a bit less than 1,600 feet per second. For a black powder weapon, this is close to the maximum possible velocity. Even then, this Kentucky rifle is only slightly more powerful than a pistol of today chambered for the 9 millimeter Luger cartridge. Because this round leaden ball has a terrible ballistic coefficient, what velocity and energy it did have rapidly decayed due to air resistance. At 185 yards, the weapon has roughly the energy and effect of a 9 millimeter pistol at 130 yards. On the chart, we see the combat range is increased. I have called this battle site range, but remember anything beyond 80 or 90 yards requires aim off or Kentucky windage. The trade-off for range is its greatly reduced volume of fire and one and a half rounds per minute is probably generous. In the scene you just watched, it took 52 seconds per round. Lastly, the Kentucky rifle mounted no bayonet. When the enemy closed, as he certainly would because of the low rate of fire, there was no choice but to fight with club rifles and knives. When Kentucky riflemen attempted to stand and fight, they almost invariably were swept from the field. They were effective and made a contribution only when the leader understood the weapon's strengths and advantages and weaknesses and wove this into his organization and battle plan. An example of this is the Battle of Cowpens, where Daniel Morgan arranged his defending troops in three general defensive belts, with the Kentucky riflemen being in front near where the houses are today. His instructions were to them were to fire two rounds only and then retire along a predetermined path to a sheltered area in the rear. The riflemen did considerable damage to Tarleton's forces, who, when they closed on the riflemen's position, found themselves confronted with two defensive belts of the Continental Line, the last being near the hedge. I think my statement at the beginning has perhaps become overly obvious. The Kentucky rifle was not technically ready for general combat use. The American Revolution was won by the Continental Line, armed with the flintlock musket and the bayonet.